the CIA taking murder advice from literal mobsters, a controversial leader gunned down by her own disgruntled bodyguards, a would-be emperor trying to take out his own mother with a series of deranged traps that would make Jigsaw blush, and so, so, so much more. These are the most insane political assassinations in history. There's one guy we just have to start off with on our list, that is the infamous Fidel Castro, who might have broken the world record for assassination attempts, none of which actually succeeded. He allegedly survived 634 to 638 attempts on his life, and a good deal of them were from the CIA. Castro became the Bugs Bunny to the CIA's Elmer Fudd. One failed attempt involved the CIA poisoning a box of his favorite cigars with botulinum toxin. It would kill anyone who put one of those sinister stogies in their mouth. They were delivered to an unidentified person, but who even knows what happened to them after that? They were lost to the pages of history. It's not even the only time they targeted Castro on that particular vice. It's been said that he was given an exploding cigar when he was at the UN in New York City. Unlucky for the professional wet workers at the CIA, he actually quit smoking in 1985. This is just another example of how quitting smoking can save your life, kids. In need of help, the CIA turned to gangsters for advice on how to kill him. They asked Sam Giancana, the boss of the Chicago mob, and Santos Traficant, the head of the mob's Cuban operations, what to do, seeing as they all had a joint interest in getting rid of Castro so they could muscle their operation back into Cuba. In true mafioso fashion, Giancana had suggested poison pills. The CIA provided six pills to a Cuban official who'd offered to help kill Castro. After a few failed attempts, the Cuban official got panicky. He backed out, and the CIA had to abandon that plan in the end. A lot of the CIA's assassination plots were just outlandish. In 1963, the CIA got creative with a seashell. In what sounds like a James Bond parody, they were determined to use Castro's love of scuba against him. They placed explosives inside a large seashell and then painted it brightly to try to entice him. This one, however, never left the drawing board. It was considered too impractical. Can't say we disagree with that assessment. At one point, they went after him with a pen that concealed a hypodermic needle laced with poison. It was to be injected by a Cuban official working with the CIA. The official was unimpressed with the puny pen, thinking they could come up with something more sophisticated. He must have missed out on all the other wacky ideas they had. It was also just a bad day to give him the pen. It exchanged hands on November 22, 1963, the same day JFK was assassinated. The official wouldn't even take the pen to Cuba in the end. You can truly say they tried everything, including the standard femme fatale angle. Marita Lorenz was Castro's lover in 1959, and she was recruited as a contract agent for the CIA. They gave her two botulism toxin pills to put in Castro's drink. She would get cold feet, though, as so many of his would-be assassins did. She also stored the poisoned pills in a cold cream jar. This just made them gunky, and it wouldn't be so easy to hide them in his drink anymore. She recounts a harrowing tale after Castro caught on to her. He pulled out his 45 and told her, You can't kill me. Nobody can kill me. She felt deflated, but he simply grabbed her and made love to her once again. Castro was right when he said nobody could kill him. He was 90 years old when he kicked the bucket of natural causes. Nobody could kill him. The only thing he couldn't defeat was the greatest assassin of all, time itself. Moving on from Castro, let's look into some of the other craziest political assassinations that were actually successful in taking out their targets. Normally, your bodyguards are the ones that keep you safe from an assassination, but that was not the case for Indriya Gandhi, the third prime minister of India from 1966 to 1977. She was a controversial figure because she supported the independence cause in East Pakistan, leading to the creation of Bangladesh. She also crossed the Sikh community when she ordered Operation Blue Star, where the Indian armed forces removed Sikh separatists and Sikh militant Jarail Singh Bindranwali from the holiest site of Sikhism, the Golden Temple. Obviously, this didn't sit well with the Sikhs. On October 31, 1984, she was meant to be interviewed for a documentary for Irish television, but there was one thing that was going to stop that from happening, her assassination. She was killed by two of her Sikh bodyguards, Satwant Singh and Beant Singh. They shot her with the very weapons they were meant to protect her with, providing a timeless lesson of how important it is not to create grudges with the people who follow you around with loaded guns all day. Let's go even further back in time to the Roman Empress Agrippina the Younger. In an act that would have Freud salivating, her own son, 
all-time weirdo, future emperor, and acclaimed fiddle player Nero plotted her assassination. It's said that he once plotted to create a mechanical ceiling above his mother's bed that would crush her to death. When this idea didn't work out because real life is sadly not an Indiana Jones movie, he moved on to an even more complicated idea. This treasonous son would drown his royal mother at sea in the most convoluted way possible. Instead of pushing her overboard or anything so plebeian, he designed a ship that would open at the bottom while at sea. The ship worked as planned. While she was at sea, the bottom opened up and dropped her into the water. What didn't work out was the assassination itself. Agrippina swam back to shore, meaning that Nero had to send an assassin to kill her the old-fashioned way. He would claim then that his mother was plotting to kill him instead and that she had been responsible for her death, not him. It's alleged that her dying words to her assassin were smite my womb. Nero later commented on how beautiful her corpse was at her funeral just to make it even more weird. Heading over to 17th century Switzerland, Jörg Janansd was an extremely disliked political leader which the world seems to have oodles of. Janansh once had killed a political rival with an axe in 1621 and didn't seem to lose a wink of sleep over it. Typical politician behavior if you ask us, but karma would get him in the end. In 1639 it was Carnival, where everyone was dressed up in elaborate costumes, making it easy for Janansh's assassin to sneak by while dressed as a bear. Nicolas Cage would be proud, and somehow no one seemed to be concerned that a bear was carrying an axe which the bear-suited assassin quickly buried in Yanash with incredible fervor. Axe murdering isn't the soup du jour these days, but it's still far more common than toothpaste murder, and that's what makes Patrice Lumumba's assassination story so unique. During the Cold War, Lumumba was the first democratically elected prime minister of the Democratic Republic of Congo in June 1960. And if you know anything about democratically elected heads of state in the developing world, you'll know that there was immediately a price on Lumumba's head. He would become a target of many failed assassination attempts, including a plot to inject toxins into his food and toothpaste, courtesy of the CIA. But just like the numerous unsuccessful attempts to kill Castro, the plan died in its infancy. In 1961, Lumumba was instead executed by firing squad during a coup. Belgium would apologize for their involvement in his assassination in 2002. Why were America and Belgium so involved in his assassination, though? In the United States' case, it was because Lumumba was a pan-Africanist, and he was on good terms with the Soviets. Belgium was more concerned that he'd threaten their stake in Katanga, a mineral-rich province. Katanga had been trying to separate from the Democratic Republic of Congo with Belgium's help. What happened to the poisonous toothpaste? Larry Devlin, the CIA's Congo station chief at the time, was stunned when told to give Lumumba the toothpaste. Instead, he would hide it in his office safe before throwing it into the Congo River. Next, we're looking at Admiral General Luis Carrero Blanco, the Prime Minister of Spain in 1973. He came into office after fascist dictator Francisco Franco, and he had plenty of enemies, including the ETA, or Uscari Ta Akatasuna, a Basque separatist group. They plotted to kill him in what they called Operacion Ogro. They rented an apartment that was on the driving route that Blanco took in order to attend mass. To keep the landlords from asking too many pesky questions, they claimed to be sculpture students, and sculpt they did. They spent five months making a tunnel underneath the street and packed it with 180 pounds of explosives that they'd stolen from a government depot. On December 20, 1973, three ETA members dressed up as electricians and detonated the explosives by command wire when Blanco passed. The blast sent Blanco and his car flying 66 feet into the air. He went flying over the five-story church and landed on a second-floor terrace on the other side. Blanco initially survived the explosion but died in the hospital later on. His bodyguard and driver also died. Talk about bad luck. Georgi Markov, a Bulgarian dissident writer and communist defector, had a far less explosive death. He would lose his life to an umbrella. In what sounds like an episode of Breaking Bad, Markov was killed when he was stabbed in the leg with an umbrella filled with ricin while standing at a bus stop. He had felt a sting on his leg, but when he turned around he only saw a man picking up his umbrella and walking away. Markov died four days later. They would discover a pellet with 0.2 milligrams of ricin in it during the autopsy, but they never found out who was responsible. Most assumed the KGB was behind it, which is a pretty safe bet, given that they're second only to the CIA for this kind of thing. Coming back to America, you might already be familiar with Abraham Lincoln's assassination. 
But did you know about the assassination attempt on his Secretary of State, William Seward? While Booth was focused on killing Lincoln, Lewis Powell targeted Seward, an outspoken abolitionist, at his home. Seward was recovering after a carriage accident left him with several broken bones, including his jaw. When Powell arrived, he told Seward's butler that he was there to deliver medicine. The butler didn't fall for it and told him to wait, but Powell was ready to take on anybody who got in the way of his mission. He pushed past the butler and headed to the second floor, making a beeline for the bedrooms to find Seward. Powell then proceeded to kick butt as he knocked out Seward's son, Frederick, and then stabbed an army sergeant. As if Seward wasn't having a bad enough week, Powell jumped on his bed and stabbed him in the face. But ironically, Seward's existing injuries would be what saved him. The metal brace that was helping mend his jaw protected him from the full force of the knife. Powell did get one good slice into his neck. That's where the majority of Seward's blood would come from. Powell assumed he must have killed Seward. When Seward's other son, Augustus, came into the room, Powell then fought him too. He stabbed Augie and took off running. Despite all the dramatics, every single person Powell attacked survived. Powell would avoid being captured for days, but we have to imagine the complete lack of success was at least a little embarrassing. When former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher died, many people in Britain celebrated by playing Ding Dong the Witch is Dead. Seriously, it breached the top 10 of the British music charts that week. So it's no surprise that there was at least one assassination attempt on her life. In 1984, when Bobby Sands, an IRA hunger striker, died, the IRA wanted to hit the government where it hurt, and that was by assassinating Margaret Thatcher. They knew she would be attending the annual Conservative Party conference and cooked up a plan. Three weeks before the conference, IRA bomb maker Patrick McGee checked into the Grand Hotel in Brighton, England under the assumed name of Roy Walsh. He would place a bomb in room 629 made from parts of a VCR. The bomb was timed to explode on October 11th at 2.53 a.m. on the closing day of the conference. They planned for the bomb to collapse the entire building with Thatcher inside, killing plenty of innocent people along with her. The bomb did blow up as planned. The good news is that it did not destroy the entire building. The bad news is it did kill five people and injure 30. After all that headache, stress, and violence, Thatcher had come out of it unscathed. She managed to avoid being crushed by a collapsing chimney column that was only a few feet from her room. McGee was a better bomb maker than he was a spy. He left his fingerprints all over the check-in card and was quickly arrested. He was sentenced to eight life sentences and given a maximum of 35 years in jail. He was released in 1999, though, under the Good Friday Agreement prisoner exchange. Shockingly, Thatcher's senior advisor, Harvey Thomas, has since forgiven him for the bombing and even became friends with the man. Talk about turning the other cheek. As much as McGee may have changed his ways, we have to believe that at least a little part of him was celebrating on the day Margaret Thatcher died. But it doesn't stop there. We have a few more failed but wacky attempts for you. Andrew Jackson got extremely lucky when two pistols misfired saving his life. Richard Lawrence was an unemployed painter who had the distinct honor of being the first person to attempt to assassinate the President of the United States. He took his shot, figuratively and literally, on January 30, 1835, when Andrew Jackson was exiting the U.S. Capitol building after attending a House member's funeral. Lawrence intercepted him and shot, but nothing happened. The percussion cap ignited, but the gun misfired. He took out yet another pistol and tried again. You have to remember, reloading guns was an ordeal back then. It was just better to have a backup. But fate was on Jackson's side when that gun also misfired. Some people say Jackson tried to beat Lawrence with his cane, but it is likely that he was rushed from the scene. We have to say we like the idea of him hitting a would-be assassin with his cane instead, though. Why did Lawrence try to kill him? Well, Lawrence lived under the delusion that he himself was the King of England. It seems that he was taking back his country from Jackson. Lawrence was placed in a mental institution afterward. The best part is that 100 years after, the Smithsonian tested the guns and they fired on the first attempt. So maybe we shouldn't scoff too much at divine intervention. We've heard of people being heavy sleepers, but former President Harry Truman takes the cake on that. He nearly slept through his own attempted assassination. While the White House was being renovated, Truman was temporarily living at the official home of the Vice President Blair House. On November 1, 1950, Griselio Torresola and Oscar Cojazzo, native-born Puerto Ricans, attempted to shoot their way into the Blair House. At the time, Truman was in one of the second-story bedrooms, taking a nice little post-launch nap when the pair launched their attack. Torresola and Cojazzo had planned the attack to line up with the uprisings in Puerto Rico. They got into a shootout with the White House police and Secret Servicemen, 
making it to the front steps before being seriously wounded. Torresola was shot in the head and killed instantly. Before going down, the two were able to kill police officer Leslie Caulfield, who would die four hours after the attack at the hospital. Truman heard the commotion and opened his window to look before being told by the Secret Service to hide inside. Kujatsu was sentenced to death, but Truman changed that to life in prison. In 1979, Jimmy Carter commuted his sentence and Kojatsu was able to go back to Puerto Rico. On the surface, the death of Japan's former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe doesn't seem so unusual, but when you begin to dig deeper, you start to see how utterly insane it really was. He was the longest-serving leader of modern-day Japan, so it shocked all of Japan when he was fatally shot at close range. He was out in public standing at an intersection outside of a train station in Nara when the gunman struck. Footage shows that there had been an opening to protect him, but his bodyguards were too slow to act. Abe was declared dead at Nara Medical University Hospital, having bled to death after his heart and the front of his neck were wounded. Since Japan has strict gun control laws, it was a shock to see a politician lose his life to gun violence. Political violence isn't a common occurrence in Japan either, so what happened? Things began to get even stranger when they identified their main suspect as Tetsuya Yamagami. He had been searching online to find instructions about how to make firearms, then ordering gun parts as well as gunpowder, so it was a bit of a smoking gun, if you will. From 2002 to 2005, Yamagami served in the Maritime Self-Defense Force where he would sometimes be expected to do breakdowns and maintenance on the guns, giving him unfettered access to them. It also meant he had in-depth knowledge of how a rudimentary gun was built. Yamagami blamed the Unification Church for his mother's money problems and believed Abe was a member of that church. The Unification Church is a cult founded by Sun Myung Moon. In pop culture, members of it are known as the Moonies, in reference to Sun Myung Moon's surname. Yamagami's mother was also a Moonie, and the Unification Church had financially sucked her dry. Turned out that Abe wasn't even a member of the church, but his family did have ties to them, and he praised them for their commitment to traditional values. And of course, it would not be a list of utterly insane assassinations without the death of Grigory Ifimovich Rasputin, the Russian mystic who seemed harder to kill than bedbugs. Rasputin was a self-proclaimed holy man, faith healer, and sex maniac who managed to get into the good graces of the Romanov family, the Russian royals. This gave him a voice in political matters, and there were a lot of people who understandably did not like that. On December 30, 1916, he was assassinated in the basement of the Moika Palace. Prince Felix Yusopov, the richest man in Russia and the husband of the Tsar's niece, owned it and selected it as the perfect venue for a legendary murder. Yusupov was known for living a privileged life. He had been criticized by Tsar Nicholas's daughter, Grand Duchess Olga, for refusing to enlist, and he didn't like his reputation as a less than noble, noble draft dodger. While others might go on a live-laugh-love vacation, Yusupov decided he'd reinvent himself by murdering a man. He wanted to be seen as a man of action, known for protecting the throne from a malevolent entity. The Romanov's closeness to Rasputin also had hurt the reputation of the monarchy. Yusupov saw this as his chance to redeem the royal family's standing while he also repaired his own image. It didn't hurt that Tsar Nicholas II might also go back to listening to his family more often with Rasputin dead. Those of you who like journaling might relate to Yusupov writing down the whole event in his memoirs. According to Yusupov, he had invited Rasputin to his palace so that he could meet Irina, Yusupov's wife. This, of course, was a lie. Irina wasn't even at home at the time. Once there, Yusupov offered Rasputin a platter of cakes and glasses of wine that were laced with potassium cyanide. For most of us, that would be enough to kill us on the spot. Rasputin was unaffected, and as any of us would be in his position, Yusupov was stunned. Needing to kill Rasputin some other way, Yusupov then borrowed a revolver from the Grand Duke Dmitri to just shoot him. The gunshot didn't accomplish the job. In his memoir, Yusupov said the devil who was dying of poison, who had a bullet in his heart, must have been raised from the dead by the powers of evil. There was something appalling and monstrous in his diabolical refusal to die. It was said that he must have died of drowning since they supposedly found water in his lungs. Rasputin's death became a story that people passed around for generations, adding mystique and intrigue to Rasputin even decades later. The man even has a whole song written about him. Not a lot of people can say that. But here is the twist. It is very possible that Yusupov made the whole ordeal up, and the death was nowhere near as scandalous or supernatural. Rasputin's daughter Maria wrote her own book in 1929. 
Rasputin, the man behind the myth, a personal memoir. His daughter had an almost fantastical ending of her own. She left Russia to join the circus as a lion tamer. She was known for performing magic over wild beasts just as her father dominated men. She also called herself the daughter of the famous mad monk whose feats in Russia astonished the world. She was a hell of a marketer, to say the least. Maria believed that the murder was probably far less thrilling than how Yusupov painted it. In the book, she condemned her father's murder and outright questioned how much Yusupov might have been lying about. Her father didn't like sweets, and she couldn't imagine him eating a platter of cakes. She also pointed out that the autopsy report said nothing of poison or drowning. What it actually stated is that Rasputin was shot at close range in the head. She accused Yusupov of trying to sell more books by making her father's death a spectacle, painting it as an epic fight between good and evil. Yusupov's plan didn't even work when it came to getting Nicholas II and Alexandra back in line. They did not radically change their behavior, and the murder did not improve the Romanovs' relations with their people. In fact, many of the poor people in Russia saw Rasputin as one of them and mourned his death. It was only the upper class that seemed to lather Yusupov with praise. As far as the Bolsheviks are concerned, Rasputin was a symbol of the corruption within the imperial court and proof that Tsarism was greatly flawed. After the Russian Revolution, provisional government leader Alexander Kerensky said, without Rasputin, there would have been no Lenin. We still consider Rasputin's death to be pretty crazy even if you don't believe a word Yusupov says. Now go check out insane ways Vladimir Putin survived assassination attempts, or watch this video instead.